Bonjour tout le monde, welcome to another episode of the Point of No Return podcast, where we go behind the scenes to understand the secrets and strategies of some of the most interesting Canadian technology companies. On this week's show, I had the pleasure of speaking with Raphael Steinman, co-CEO and founder at Maxa. Raphael is a serial entrepreneur, he's built multiple software companies, and this one is, I want to say, the one with the biggest ambition, really, is thinking about reinventing the ERP space. What Maxa does, it's a data automation layer that really helps businesses get more answers and better BI from their ERP. The ERP obviously being the system of record for every single company on the planet. And we really dove into the state of ERPs today, why we think the, the, the space is complex yet ripe for disruption, how he's really thinking about this next generation of ERPs and system of record, selling painkillers versus vitamins and how his business is really selling a painkiller. Some of the technical innovations that they're building a conceptual language to create predictive analytics and his big vision of really building this huge platform and automating pan- manpower. I really hope that you'll enjoy today's episode. Raf, real pleasure to have you, man, at your offices and in-person interviews. It's rare, so I'm excited to, to be doing this. Obviously, we're speaking about Reforia, man. I'm, I'm super stoked to learn about, obviously, Maxa, which you guys are doing, and of course, the ERP space, which I think is a fascinating one because it's, it's such a big market hiding in plain sight. So maybe to kick things off, maybe give us a rundown of the state of the ERP market today, how you see it. Yeah, so it's great to be here and even more in person. A long time in the making and it's great to have a chat face-to-face. So I guess the ERP space, it's a space that's been, that exists almost everywhere across all industries. And if you think of what is an ERP, well, any company that hits a certain size, at one point you're going to need a system of record to just track stuff that's going on as it's going through your processes. The easiest one is the lead to cash process. So from going from a lead to a sales order to maybe a work order or a contract or a project or execution or timesheets or invoices or payments or like the entire conversion of like work or items that you ship into money. There's a system that has to be there or systems that have to be there just to help out the business to, to function. So at its very core, that's what an ERP is. It's just a system of record onto which you can have fint processes. So you guarantee that things are done in the proper way and that you can go back in time and figure out like what, what happened and who owes what to what and what's not done. And how does it evolve with the advent of cloud? Because for me, I'm thinking about like SAP on-prem, big servers in the basement. How's, how, how has tech actually impacted that space? Has there been more fragmentation or I know ACP is still a dominant gorilla in the space, right? Obviously it's for the enterprise. So yeah, curious to hear you a little bit. on. So if you think of like ERPs, of course, like the latest bleeding edge technology in ERP space, like everything moved to the cloud. But if you like think of what an ERP is, like an ERP is it's at the heart of a business, right? So if you think of specifically big businesses, like biz, big businesses usually have been existing before the cloud. And changing the ERP is literally an open heart surgery. Like you can actually look at every company who some, so either goes belly up or has really hard financial troubles. If you really double click, or if you had all the information, you may even, you most of the time or very often will discover that there's probably an ERP upgrade, change, switch, integration that actually went wrong and they lost control of the business. Because like suddenly you start not knowing who owes you money. You start sending wrong invoices to customers. Like business actually can really degrade quickly. So it is at the core of businesses. And because it's at the core, once you install one, like you could almost say it has, it's going to be there for at least 10 years. Big businesses that have been running ERPs probably have installed the ERP pre-cloud. There are new ones. There's like Oracle NetSuite, which is a pure cloud, very nice play. They're very good. They're, they have a strong footprint in the tech industry, which is normal because tech industry is very uh, lively. Businesses come up, they grow really fast. Uh, so it's a, that's a good play. But if you look more at businesses across, there is still an amazing amount of installs, which are on-prem or I'll call them almost like private clouds. So like they're on-prem just in the cloud, but it's still the same sort of logic of installation, like a big database with big servers. They're just virtualized in the cloud now. Yeah, and my, also my understanding is that these things are all different and don't always talk to each other. So like we're working with a big customer on our end and they had acquired, I think, 27 companies 
And that gave them a total of 27 ERPs. And it, it just, it was just like, I remember we were talking to the CEO and reconciling the numbers at the end of the quarter was a, like a massive human effort of getting all the numbers, like being them into Excel, crunching all the data. It just sounded horribly <laughs> inefficient, but they said it was a big public company and this is, they had to do this. How is, how was like, how do you think about complexity in this space? It seems to be getting, uh, like you said, like cloud on-prem hybrid makes it more complex maybe for a CIO. It's at the very core, if you look back, like what's an ERP, it's a system of record with you slap on some process management and just like a, you, you allow different actors to input and, re and access information. But every ERP is different. SAP, NetSuite, then you have these more like just GD Edwards. It's a legacy ERP, it still has massive installs because it, it's the heart, it's the beating heart of a lot of businesses and you, you can't change them. And all these systems have quote unquote, their own cryptic the data schema or their own little thing. There is a reason why that exists. Like the, historically the ERP system, the ecosystem had a very strong incentive to make it hard to transition because also they had a very, like the whole ecosystem revolves on, there's these big uh, software editors, uh, like SAP, NetSuite, and, and then they have their whole ecosystem of partners who actually do the installation. So if you think of an installation of ERP, it's you buy a ton of really expensive software, and then you buy a ton of professional services to install, configure, tweak, change, and maintain this professional software that you have. There is, if it's more complex, you sell more hours. If it's more complex, you sell more hours, then it's harder to remove. So it's like they had, they've been historically, they've had a very strong desire to be hard to remove, but also to keep their ecosystems built to make a lot of money. So complexity was actually like a feature or almost like maybe not a feature, but it would, they didn't have any uh, strong desire to make it really simple and interchangeable because then they become a commodity and hot swappable. So like at what you were describing is it's still a burning problem. And we'll get that, get back to that maybe a little later. That's literally what Max is zeroing on is like that sort of disjointed, siloed, very complex, very hard to integrate, many views of the same thing, not always the same reality, that type of stuff. That it was, yeah, it was a little bit of a leading question to get to Max that maybe before we talk about your startup, like you, a serial entrepreneur, multiple businesses, like last one, obviously that you sold, what led you down the path of wanting to start another business? And Particularly, how do you hone in on the space? So was it like you looked at your piece, like, hey, this fascinating, I've seen this issue, or was it the idea came up? Yes, yeah, just, maybe just to hear about the genesis. So I guess the, the sounding story of Max uh, goes back, it probably starts like 20 years ago in my previous business, where we were actually, our beautiful software was, it, the result of everything we did ended up being exported into ERPs and then from timesheets, payroll, inventory, all this beautiful stuff, the analytics, everything was given to the ERPs and then just processed and, and analyzed for, from by businesses. And I guess when I, when, I, when I sold my shares in my previous business and looking around, okay, what other, I guess my mind was looking for a problem to solve. And one thing that kept back coming at me is across all industries, across all customers I had in like my life as an entrepreneur in the enterprise space was. Everybody's been complaining that like the analytics, the intelligence, the ability to extract insights out of their ERP is, is super hard. And we had asked, your systems are great. Can we just circumvent these ERPs? Can we go straight to the source? And of course, back then, like the building blocks to do that, because there's just so much data, there's so much uh, noise almost. Like it's not, human, it's not humanly possible for somebody to triage that. You're going to need some high powered algorithms. You need massive compute. And you probably need some like machine intelligence to sift through that and surface up what's re connect things, sift through it. And just so that like remove the, like the burden of just the, the load of data to be analyzed. So back then, like that problem or that ask was like, well, it's a great ask, but like the technology is not even close to do that. And I guess 2017, 2018 was like a year where it's probably me just taking a step back. Was like, I think the building blocks are here now. The cloud is here. The cloud is actually becoming a commodity. So like we clearly know cloud costs won't go up and they're probably coming down every year. AI is super hype. So, okay, we had the first AI super hype. So it's probably way over promising. 
But what happens, what happens when the tech starts overpromising? You probably can fast track three, four years from now, something's going to be stable, actually being like properly ap applicable. So let me double click on this. I guess the founding story of Max is really there. So it's this decade old problem that I've just been like, been told or asked by previous customers. And just the realization of, oh, I think the time is here. The technology is there. The timing is here. Customers are really open to the cloud. Like moving precious data to the cloud is not something that has resistance anymore. 10 years ago, telling a CFO, I'm going to remove all your financial transactions to the cloud. Probably a little pushback for now. We get no pushback. It's more like, how quickly can I get my insights? That's really what they want. So I guess the timing was right. So, and then in 2019, that's when we, uh, we stood up Maxa and said, okay, let's go see if we can tackle this decadal problem of extracting some uh, worthy insights of uh, disjointed, complex, cryptic, many business schemas and bring it into one source of truth that's refined by machines that human beings can really spend their time on the, the most valuable work, the business. And hopefully target for customers to, to solve those problems. Do you have a target set? Like when you started out, you're like, oh, we're going to go after enterprise or mid-market companies or a particular sector. How did you then isolate, okay, this is the type of companies that experience this issue? So it's a really, it's a really good question because if you just zoom out and say, okay, ERPs, where, what sector, who does this apply to? And more importantly, what type of personas? An ERP is everywhere. Like at a certain scale, you need an ERP or, or some form of systems that together behave as an, as a, as an ERP. Then you look at, okay, so who actually deals with an ERP? Sales deal with an ERP, operations deal with an ERP, finance deals with the ERP, HR deals with the ERP. So, okay. It's actually across the C-suite or across the various sort of functions of a business. So it's an opportunity, but it's a real challenge because technically you can say any business worthy that is like driving and has a certain volume. Everybody in the company at one point will have to deal with the ERP or interact with it, or at least try to get, or ask IT to extract some data into Excel. That's everybody has to do that. So we, at first we probably were driven a little bit by opportunity. So our initial customers were from, uh, and when I say a customer, it's like, I call a customer, somebody who's going to give you money that you don't know. So you have to extract money from somebody that you don't know. That's a customer. Otherwise it's like a R and D person or a trustworthy, or somebody who's going to give you feedback. So I guess our first customers were probably more opportunities, meaning, okay, let's go see if we can, first of all, can companies give us their precious data and they don't know us, therefore maybe the trust is not there. Secondly, can we actually extract some money from them and try to deliver value? Um, and we purposely tried to get as many various industries as possible, just to see which ones will the pain. I like the metaphor saying selling vitamins is great, but it's not, but if you sell Tylenol, like you'll know right away you're selling Tylenol. Like the person will reach over the table and grab it out of your hands. And as you're pitching, they'll pop a couple because it, yeah, I love that analogy. I love that analogy. Like I find my business sells like a lot of said vitamins and not painkillers. And I feel the painkiller businesses are always the best because you're solving a real issue that's hurting today. So yeah, so, so we're trying to like test, okay, let's test a few industries, see who, to whom this would be an Advil. Like that, that's the model we're trying to do. And of course, like you're like any startup, like we, what you think the market is going to ask or want and what, when you deliver, like you get these fantastic surprises. Like I remember like we, to really do some fireworks, like we build the most amazing inside dashboard that a machine can produce. Like it was me, if I was the general manager, the CEO of this company, this is the dashboard I want. Then we present the dashboard. And for some reason, they zero in on this little widget at the bottom, right. That's the most useless thing that like, what's that? And then you should double click, double click on it. And can I have just that? And you're like, why? And then, well, because we have lost control of that metric and we need it. It's so perverse everywhere, error return rates. But to capture an error return rate, it's like we sell in 10,000 locations. How am I going to know where and kind of pick up the early signal? Like, it's amazing. So you, the reality, it's a, the key thing in startups, like you got to go, when you ship your first product for the first time you ship, if you're not a little ashamed of it, you probably waited too long. So that's, that was the first product. We were a little ashamed of it, but we like had to do a little bit of duct tape behind folding everything. But we got that feedback and that was like, no, it's this widget, it's that widget. And then you have all the hard work of trying to align your, your, your pitch, that your pricing has to be right. If you look at the way what Maxa sells today, like behind the scenes, the tech, it's the same, but the pitch, the problem, just framing the problem that you're solving, like it's amazing. Just frame it differently. And suddenly you're selling Advil. 
it's the same tech, it's the same thing. We do the same thing, but you're not resonating the same way. Uh, and that's like at the beginning, the experiment is, okay, let's go cross industries and just try to get these like running experiments, trying to figure out. And of course, can you start up the experiments? They all fail. So, <laughs> so you don't get like a lucky one. It's actually probably, in the end, it's probably better because you have to do the, actually the hard work of, okay, go back to drawing boards. Let's run another batch of experiments and figure out. And then suddenly you start realizing like, okay, we're getting, we very quickly realized the min market is a really good market because just the cycle of this, the decision power. So they're big enough. So when I say min market, 50 million to about a billion dollars in revenue, uh, that type of, so of course they have enough transactional history, like to run a $50 million business, you've been existing at least three years. And my, uh, my data scientists and my team will tell you, you need at least three years to prove their seasonality. So like it gives you a good, uh, so 50 million to start with, but up to a billion, the exec team, the decision power tends to be a little more controlled and focused. It's less big committees, big sort of strategic, big lich budget cycles. If you do, if you are solving a real pain, they'll pull you in a little quicker. They'll, they'll, you'll end up right away in the CEO's office and they'll like, okay, how much does it cost? I want it now and let's, let's try it. So I think it was a, we realized like they move a little faster. We can run experiments a little quicker and get some, some feedback. Build your brand, get customers, exactly. and your work your way up. From that initial, let's say it's a failed experiments and gaining traction and like revenue and like actual proof points. How would you describe the pain point you guys are solving today? Is it the one that works the best that you guys are building and scaling and getting money? So this is the most like after the, what I call the brutal crossing of the desert when you're startup, cause like nothing works and then nothing works and then you're running out of cash and then nothing works and then you're trying nothing works. And then if you're lucky or you work hard or it's a mixture of everything, you get to cross the desert and then you realize I just, I found that little motion. I found that secret little sauce that like just will get somebody to lean in right away. So like what I like doing is, so I actually was talking to a CIO last week and usually CIOs are not the ones we talk to. We talk usually to CFOs, CEOs, COOs, CROs. CIOs tend to be less, but sometimes there's, I'll call them the business. There's CIOs that are very in the business. They're not necessarily just tech. This is one of these CIOs that's really immersed in the business. And so he's like, okay, I got 20 minutes. Show me your stuff, Rafael. What, what, what does Max do? So do you agree with me that enterprise BI and analytics don't move at the speed of your business? Or the other way of putting it is, quote unquote, it sucks. But then you look at him and we're on video conference and all oh, I see just a smile, like a little nod, like, okay, yeah. And then imagine you had a machine that take all your beautiful data, all that raw transactional, your systems of record, stand that up, refine it, chop it up in past, present, future, deliver all the analytics, the forecasting, everything. And then you just had to pick off a buffet, all the analytics you want. And with a click of a button, you can regenerate everything as you want every day. So then the customer says, that sounds like the magic button that everybody's been promising, but nobody's been delivering. And I guess this is the fun part where you start realizing like a, a business is not just a pitch. It's not just technology. Like the business model is super important. So this is when you say that this one, uh, this is what I, the part I love is we do, at Maxa, we don't sell professional services. It's we're pure SaaS. It's a machine that does everything. So the answer to how do I know that what Max is offering it is correct, that I can trust it. And the answer to that is you don't have to trust it. You can try it. Okay. So yeah, that's interesting. I didn't know. So you offer like a, a free trial model or like a free onboarding, but so, doesn't it require like a shit ton of, I'm just thinking about what you guys do, right? So you have to ingest all the customer's data, right? Yeah. So you need to build something that's going to talk to their current system of record, I imagine. Yeah. Right? So I guess the best metaphor, this is, uh, the best way to view Max, the platform that we've built is we've, there's a core building block that we call Muse. So it's called Maxa universal schema for the enterprise. So I guess the metaphor that I use is if you look at Google Translate, so like Google Translate for a long time was like a trend. There's like a billion, tra thousands of tra translation engines on the web. And then suddenly out of nowhere, it just rocketed up. It was like way better than everything. And like now everybody uses Google Translate and we just forgot about the others. And the reason why is at a certain point, either they're AI or they figured it out. But anyways, the fundamental change that happened at Google Translate was there, they created an intermediate language. That intermediate language, what happens is, let's say you take before was translating English. You had a model for English to Japanese, English to French, English to Spanish, English to Portuguese, English to all the thousands or hundreds of other languages that you need to support and then vice versa. You had the reverse model. So there's a lot of stuff to maintain. And of course the models that have more people get more love and there's 
What happened at Google is they actually created an intermediate language, which is a conceptual language. It cannot be written, cannot be spoken, cannot be, it's just a mathematical uh, concept language that's able to reading a language in English, extract the concepts. And then, so you got data, you got concept in, concept out. And then from that master language, they have all the outputs. And suddenly flipping from one, any language became super easy. And the machine was always learning on a single model. So it was able to learn new concepts across languages. So it became exponential, it becomes a lot faster. And that's why it became really good. Zoom back to Maxa. Muse is that intermediate language. So we're able, we found a way, and again, we found a way to take these cryptic different systems or silo or schemas and map them to a new schema that is generic. So we get CRM, ERP, operations, warehousing, we'll go cloud, Salesforce, Asana, Trello. We, map, we have a schema we're able to map that into. And so the question then falls is, okay, great to Raphael, that sounds great, but like, why Maxa? How did you, like, how come you guys figured this out where probably everybody's been running after that? Reality is that to build this new schema, you've, you had, you can only do it after 2017. There's building blocks that did not exist. And building blocks are the, as follows. All the data schemas of every business system in the enterprise has been built on the premise of storage and compute are really finite resources. Storage is super expensive, compute really constrained. And no, you cannot uh, lock up the CPU because you just, the database also will work. And so every, all the schemas are built around those risk constraints. When you move to the cloud, you have bottomless storage, infinite storage, infinite compute. So you can tear through a billion rows in like seconds, which you can start having completely like the ski, the, the whole fundamental way you put schemas out, the star schemas and all, all, you can change that. Not saying it's not proper. You're allowed to, you're allowed to do new things that you cannot do before. You could experiment. With your fees around, exactly. And then once you have Muse and you have one schema, you can start having algorithms that don't really care what's, what business systems are running. They're looking at dimensions, metrics, time, crunching that. So you can, that's how you get massive productization of everything. Now, it's great that you have a schema, but also we've figured out when we have this technology that allows to, when we engage with a customer, we have an FP&A team that will deconstruct the ask of the customer in metrics. So what is fp &A? Financial planning and analysis. So they're, they're, they're the practice in businesses that take any question, analytics and deconstruct it. And I'll call the fundamentals of a business, the building blocks, the metrics, everything. They can explain it. They use all the best practices. So like in 2023, that's done. Like it's the McKenzie's of this world and all the consultings and everything. Like there is a base of knowledge that an FPA specialist can really do a great job. The hardest part is now taking that and flipping that into more of technical. We've mapped that to Muse. So the speed at which we can map a new ERP, like from what used to take months or years, it's days or maybe single digit weeks to finish, like from zero, from customer signing the contract to production readiness. Once we have Muse and you start building great analytics, you're building it on Muse, which then makes it start to become highly reusable. Every algorithm that we build for a customer could, if, you're, if they're using the same metrics, the same dimensions, 100% reusable across the board. So if you think of Maxa, if you think of, let's say Airtable, very easy uh, SaaS business, when you buy Airtable or you sign up on Airtable, you're getting the fundamental engine of Airtable, but you're also getting the hundreds of templates that come with it. So you never start with a blank sheet of paper. You're like, oh, I need a CRM. I need to manage my marketing campaigns. I need to manage this. You have these examples that can easily inspire yourself and spin. Think of analytics. Like we're start, we're, we are angling to bringing BI analytics, advanced out, like predictive analytics, advanced analytics, almost as a commodity where these building blocks can be reused and best practices can be re-delivered and really deliver speed. So if you think of what does Maxa deliver, we fundamentally are, with our technology, we're, we're, we are commoditizing what used to be like very hard work, like you said earlier, like it's time consuming, it's cryptic. So we're commoditizing it, we're bringing speed and really allowing BI and analytics or even advanced analytics to actually start moving the speed of the business. So CFOs, COs, seat suites have questions, they get answers. They don't have a six month or a year roadmap of BI that maybe one day they'll get.
Okay. So I guess one comment, one question. First, a comment, just a random idea. I think you should maybe consider renaming the company to Muse. I find it, it, it signifies much more what you guys do. That is, take it or leave it. Uh, it might be a stupid idea. The second question is, obviously, you imagine you have an ML team. You guys are building the, uh, the algorithms to recognize these patterns and then pr produce the analytics. What are you then providing as a front end to, to the customer? Do they have a dashboard? They log in and they see the data? Do, or is it more like an SQL or input your questions and then we'll spit it out? So yeah, how does the front end look? So our, we like to say, and this is like a new, uh, I guess it's the, the new buzzword of the last probably a uh, couple of months or maybe years. We like to say we're headless BI. So what is head, headless, headless BI? Is it, we believe that the visualization war in business analytics has been won. Power BI, Tableau, Looker, and name your visualization. There's a few out there. It's one. They're all competing. It, it's now, it, it's all diminishing returns. Like Power BI is a fantastic suite. Looker is fantastic. Tableau, they all have their perfect use cases. They should be used that way. But today, enterprise BI and analytics still does not move at the speed of business or quote unquote, sucks. And the, re the reason why it's still hard and it's, it's the layer right under, there's a missing layer that you, they're still fighting on raw data. And there's a layer that's missing that takes the raw data and brings it as one. So unifies it and then refines it, reorganize it, presents it, extracts all the value of the signal, removes the signal or does all the forecasting, the predictive uh, enhances it. And then you can start. So how does the customer, of course we have consoles so that we can do quick demos, but what we're seeing more and more, and again, I'll use my, the air table analogy is we will actually, what we like to say is we're going to show you some beautiful dashboards, but they're the beautiful dashboards you expect to see. The only thing that you will no need to note is that it didn't take months, it didn't take months to build. You get them in days because behind the scenes. And then once you build it, they become assets that you can rebuild. You also gain out of all their customers, all the analytics out of the box, you get all this great stuff. So it's like this ecosystem of new features and capabilities that are just grow. And because we're SaaS, every customer get benefits from the upgrades that we're doing across the board, across all our customers. And business model, you mentioned SaaS, like how do you charge? We have customers that range between, let's say 2.5, 3K a month to even 30, 30 and up K. The, mo the most important part is because we deliver speed. We like to say, I like to position it first month, Zero, second month, 2K, third month, 4K. And if you like it, it'll continue at 4K. And if you want add-ons, we'll, it, 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 it'll throw out. Based on usage, data. The fundamental is just crunching power. So there's just the amount of data. So those are like the, the basic increments. But because we have a machine doing it, we, say, like, we like people like taste it before they can try. So in our contract is if it doesn't work, pull the plug. So zero, if we don't drop value in the first month, you're not seeing something or you don't believe, or for some reason, what we said is not true. We're not fast. You can pull the plug, cost you nothing. Second month is in the increment. Third month, that's the price you'll get for to go into prod. At any time, you can pull the plug if it doesn't work. And then for add-on, so all our customers, our average customers running around 10, 15K, all our customers start low and then they, and then they sort of be, they build up, but they will always get a first taste before it increments. So he said, I like to see now, I'm ready for forecasting. Can we just run the forecast? We'll run the forecasting engines. We'll tune it. We'll see, does it work? First of all, is your data predictable? Some data also is not. So you also get that sort of sense check. And then if it is, then we can tune it. Is it the entire business? Let's say you have 10,000 SKUs, 10,000 customers sold in 10,000 locations. Do you really need to do 10,000 times 10,000 times 10,000? Or maybe it's a subset? Or we can sort of tweak that and figure out what, what, what makes sense. And then a load, that load will be converted into a monthly recurring. And then the customer can decide if they want it or not, if it, if it makes sense. And then that's how. And what happens is with that model, if you see value, like very quickly it becomes a bigger max of bill equals a really bigger uptake benefit for the company. So you get into, if I, like they get very quickly, they feel like I can ask questions, see if it actually makes sense. And if it does. I'll pay for it, but I don't have to wait. I don't have to upfront pay for consulting services, so on and so forth, and risk maybe failure or make a big gamble. So essentially you don't have to be conservative anymore. You actually can start asking a little more pushy questions, but also you can be a little more agile where what we see, we like to say, let's specifically when we launch, let's just take one really good question and deliver value immediately. Because once what we see is once they see how we do it, the second question that they thought initially would be, it changes. Oh, okay. This is what you can do. This is how fast you can do it. Then can you do this? And then that you get to the second question, third question, and then very quickly, okay, can you just automate our entire admin packs 
and all of it. Let's just get the machine doing what the humans are doing and let them start, get them out of Excel and work on the business. It's fascinating, man. Any use cases you can share? Perhaps not sharing the client name, but like a, a specific use case that like you guys knocked it out of the park. So we're seeing, I'll give you two big things and then I'll zero in on like a little more complex one. And then it's very simple one. So we're seeing two big themes. Uh, first theme is what we call the uh, Holy uh, Trinity or Holy Trilogy, Maxa, is demand planning, procurement, and inventory. So like most businesses, if you think of like just the manufacturing obvious, like you're trying to figure out, okay, can you project the way the business is going so I get a sense of what the sales are going to be? Because really what I need to do is I have to figure out, do I have the inventory to, to accommodate those sales? And then also procurement. So what do I have to order? Because I usually have to order way ahead of time. And then there's a whole now specific with supply chain. There's like fill rates. There's error rate. There's like, there's a lot more variance that comes into. It's not just last year's plan and then we'll just wiggle it. It's like, you actually almost have to have it dynamic. So we've seen with some customers, like we actually can go into give live per SKU supplier performances so that when you need, I need dental order a thousand of these widgets, you may end up getting, you're better off splitting the order into two suppliers and order a hundred, 20% on each because their fill rates are like 80%. So like, how do I hedge my bets based on actual performance? Not like what we thought it was a year ago and across all SKU. It's like, that's like a really good use case where the analytics that a human being can do. You cannot run that on 30,000 SKUs. Not possible. Mm -hmm. Machine does that in the blink of an eye. That's it. So like getting those three sort of parts working together. So demand forecasting, that's forecasting. Then you got just like inventory analytics, like start asking the questions like, okay, based on our forecasts, which SKUs are we going to miss inventory this week, this month? Which ones, which orders are we late on getting from our suppliers and telling you which SKUs are at risk? What inventory? Do we have dead inventory? Like all the, all these questions, like it's in the data, but it's just so hard to extract and they don't have time. And specifically now also with labor shortages, like there's less and less time actually to have the eyes on these numbers. Machine can do that really nicely. Yeah. You don't need a, like a team of analysts crunching the data. Exactly. You just pull up the request. Mm -hmm. Maybe to talk about the future a little bit. So you guys just raised around, so congrats. I think it was in June. How big, I know like, you're, I know your answer here, we're going to say, hey, it's a big market, but maybe at a second level, like how big do you see the opportunity also tied to what you're doing today and how much more your product can expand? So tying in the addressable market, plus, well, we can do new shit that doesn't exist that makes them almost market size irrelevant. So I'd like to hear you about it. It's a good question. Like I'll go back to the market we thought or we were angling on or like really uh, pushing maybe two years ago. And I'll tell you what we see now. So actually what we're pushing now. So two years ago, we I'm probably a little more technical. Okay. We've got these features. We're running ERP and we're sort of like happy. Wow. It works. Okay. We work on ERPs. Like that's what we do. And we've got this great analytics. Okay. Let's go now in the world and then start pushing that. And then, so of course, you run your experiments, like I said earlier on with your customers and it's going, it's not going well, but you're actually able to run experiments. So I guess just the ability of running experiments is a good sign in itself. People actually want to test it. So we were targeting the ERP market, which is like billions, like uh, just take, take SAP, NetSuite, GD Edwards, you probably have 30% of the market. And then the rest of the market is actually crazy niche fragmented. There's thousands and thousands, thousands, thousands of ERPs out there. It, it, it's a big market, but it's really fragmented. So that was like the market we were pushing on. And then when we started zeroing on what exactly the problem we we're solving, like initially, like today, say BI analytics suck or not with the speed of the business, but before it will give you the capacity to project yourself in the future. That, those were the problems we thought we were solving. If you go back to what we're solving today, we are not, our market is not the ERPs anymore. If you really think what our market is, it's all the payroll that is spent analyzing business data to get insight and answers. That's a trillion dollar business. So like at its most like basic version, we automate manpower. I'm not saying we can automate hundred percent. There's part of the analytics, the thinking, the reviewing, the thinking about the business, thinking about the data, looking at it, that there's a part of it that's only a human being can do, putting it into context. But there's at least a significant part. The grunt work. The grunt work. Yeah. Like the heavy lifting that a machine can do. And if you really think why businesses are not willing to invest that much more and like why don't businesses have like teams of fp &A, when they know the value in the data, they just can't bear the cost of the payroll. 
the consultants to actually run through that data. Yeah. So that's the market that right now we're like, and what's amazing is that is actually what, if you think of like when we, when I'm talking that CEO or that CFO, if you, the back end the envelope math that they're doing, they're like fully loaded resources, 150 K. I have four of them. Okay. Then I have the time and the consultant, like a million dollars. How much are you again, Russell? Like they're, that's, they're, they're actually comparing us to payroll. Yeah. Yeah. It's fascinating because it, it's, it's one of these, uh, you fall in this category, real world category of like the human creativity is untouchable, but things that could be automated will be right. Including Excel work, including it's, all this data crunching. So it's just a question of time. And you guys are obviously helping you accelerate that. So say it liberates people to do the human create the more creative tasks. Yeah. Uh, which, which I find fascinating because I think that's what we're meant to do. We're not meant to like just copy rows in Excel. Like and I used to do them my former life. So <laughs> it's like you, you're spending time playing, playing around like with these tools, so probably spending time with hypotheses and asking real business questions. Like we, we have one of our customers, they came to us and they, like the use case they had was we, it takes us 24 to 48 hours to build a quote. It's a, it's high powered company. The, the quotes are complex. Can you help us out? Fast forward with Maxa, with their team. They have a really good team. They're very savvy. They really know their business. The analytics part of building a quote now takes three seconds. Sorry, three minutes, max. Used to take, they were number crunching for 90% of those 24 to 48 hours. After three minutes, they have all the analytics done. Now imagine the time they can spend putting their customer in context, understanding is it a short-term, long-term play, what margins, discussing with the customer, there's so, like actually having the team come, let's go call the field workers. Let's go see, do they like this customer? What's the field? Do they like, is this a growth customer or not? Like all these questions that maybe they were just very quickly thinking about, they actually can double click and deep dive. And they've actually seen like a significant impact. I think it's 4% wit increase in win rate just because of the tool. And they're like a multi-million dollar company. So 4% is huge on the bottom line. Like it's just. Do you have a bigger vision for the company? So where you want to take it? So it's actually a really, it's, it's actually a really, a really good question. So if you think of what we're doing and you're, you're, you, like you, you crunch it down to the essence, it's like the machine or the algorithms is com commoditizing a significant portion of what BI analytics are for companies, making it more also like companies who could not pay for it or cannot afford it now can, or can try it and we're like, and be more agile about it. So. We are at, 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 it, at its bare bone, commoditizing BI, world-class BI analytics for companies. That's what we're doing. At that point, if you think of it, and we have, so what is Maxa? It's technology, a framework, it's a methodology, it's all that thing. But if, if you push it at the extreme, like one, one of, uh, one of our, 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 our teams yesterday said, this could actually be this crazy marketplace where the world now professionals can produce their own algorithms. And I'm a CFO of XYZ. I'm looking for a dashboard that does this. You go on the Max of Marketplace and you're like, oh, I got these beautiful dashboards and this analytics and I get like Lego blocks. I can just assemble it. I'm pushing the technology at, it, at its extreme. But if the product is done right, you could end up there. There's a platform play. There's, there, there could be a platform play or it becomes, maybe it's also a tool where you can start having what I call, and I think like future of business consulting or just consulting work, I think has to be man in the machine because you should. It should be less people, more specialized, high level, pristine, but the grunt work is done. So you can have, maybe the play is more like we empower FPNA people. So there's a key workers and companies that we like, you make them in heroes. Like one elite FPNA is now worth a hundred of what it used to be, th that type of play. Like th to me, we'll see, like, I think we're really early, but we can see like the technology technically, like if we are driving the commodity, it leads to a marketplace, like they push it there. But it could also just end up this fantastic tool that man in the machine now can really drive value. And yeah, yeah. I love the big, bold vision. It's funny hearing you talk. There's just so many cool opportunities about what you can do, where you could take this company. And it's still relatively early stage, but it sounds like you guys have product market fit. You're pounding the payment. We're talking about last night, how you're your sales as a focus. And maybe a wrap up question for you, Raphael, in terms of just how you see the future unfolding, let's say next 18, 24 months. For us, it's, it's super critical. Like we, we raised, a, I think a really good seed round. We have fantastic VCs backing us. And everybody's betting on that we're going to do a great Series A. 
And at this point, I think like the product is there. We've proven that our delivery team is, this is the, the core thing is standing up our sales team. Like that's, this round is all about standing up the sales team. So bringing on the leadership, bringing on the skill needed. And the hard part about this is really, or I guess the challenge, I won't say the hard part, it's, it's the challenge. It's the team, the sales team that we're building now will be the core of the Series A team. So it's like a sort of a, you have to be really lined up. So not just this round, it's, we have to be aligned with the, actually the next four years. So it's, it's, it has to be pure transition. It can't just be like, oh, now let's build a Series A sales team. It's going to be a continuum. So it's really spent like making sure that we're hiring great, not just good in that. And then it's just execution. Like we have the man, like or we have the leadership to drive it. Our team is excellent. Like we got these like young guys that are like, and, and girls, they're just pristine. Like they're, man, they're like, they're way better than I was when I was their age. Like they're really savvy. They know it. And it's, I think it's really execution now. It's, it's like just keep it, staying focused. The hard part of the blue ocean, like the, a blue ocean sort of play is fun because you have optionality, but it's also the risk because you can just do all kinds of things left and and not focus on the couple. Like at one point very quickly, we'll have to like, like the key thing with the sales team is going to line up, be like, okay, which industry, which use case, which persona do we need to sell to that are really repeatable? But even more importantly, if you really want to drive value, it's which ones are repeatable and grow. That is, that's what we have to crack. That's the puzzle to be solved. Rafael, uh, I could talk to you for another hour, man. This is an amazing conversation. Best of luck with Max and what you're doing. Final question, where can people reach out, connect and learn more? So uh, very simple, maxa.ai on the web, Raphael Steinman on LinkedIn, maxa, just hit me up in a message and yeah, hopefully we'll usually answer pretty quickly. Thanks for your time. Cheers. Thank you very much. As always, thanks for listening and don't forget to subscribe. If you want to learn more, check out thepnr.com.